Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my apologies for the late start in the symposium. We had a little bit of a technical issue, but here we are. Uh, my name is Ted Walter. Um, I am the executive director of the International Center for 9-11 Justice. We are a nonprofit organization uh, that is dedicated to establishing an accurate account of the events of September 11th, 2001, and to fostering a worldwide realization and reckoning about the, the truth surrounding those events. As part of our mission of researching and educating the events of 9-11, uh, we believe it is important to look at 9-11 within the broader historical context of other deep uh, structural events, structural deep events, or state crimes against democracy, which are similar or even connected to the events of 9-11. Uh, and so it is my pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to this symposium, which we are holding in honor of Graham McQueen, uh, who passed away about a year ago. Um, and in this symposium, we are going to be exploring uh, the parallels and the possible connections uh, between uh, the 9-11 and COVID events. Uh, now, before I go any further, I would just like to uh, recognize and thank UK Column for co-sponsoring this event with us. Uh, UK Column is a fearless independent news organization based in the UK um, that is responsible for live streaming the talks you're about to see. Uh, I'd also uh, like to say that I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague and friend, Marilyn Langloy. Uh, Marilyn, uh, among her many other uh, areas of activism and activities, uh, serves on the board of the International Center for 9-11 Justice. Uh, and she also, was also my co-executive producer on the film Peace for 9-11, uh, which features and is based on the research of Dr. Graham McQueen. Um, so before I go any further, I'd like to give Marilyn just an opportunity to say hi, and then in a few moments, she'll share further remarks. Hello, I'm glad to be here and welcome to you all. Hope you enjoy this program. Thanks. So as I said, this, this event is uh, very much dedicated to honoring uh, Graham McQueen. Uh, Graham, as many people know, uh, was a leading researcher of the events of 9-11. Uh, he was also a lifelong anti-war activist. He was a professor of religious studies at McMaster University for about 30 years. Um, and he passed away uh, a little bit more than a year ago on April 25th, 2023. Uh, and Graham uh, was uh, quite instrumental in um, helping to form the new International Center for 9-11 Justice, which was launched about a year ago in June of last year. Um, and he, he's essentially a founding member uh, of the organization. Um, and a dear friend of, of many of ours. Um, as we thought about, uh, we, we was clear to us that we wanted to honor Graham as we came up on the, the one year anniversary. And as we thought about it, we decided that the best way to do that would be to hold a symposium uh, where we would um, really explore in depth and educate the public about two events that he cared about deeply. Uh, one of those, of course, was 9-11. Uh, he's dedicated so much of his life to understanding what happened that day. Um, but the other one that is uh, less known about is, is the events of the, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, he, uh, like man, many people around the world, millions of people, uh, very quickly grew skeptical of the narrative that was being uh, presented to us. Um, he, di he didn't write anything about it because he was very busy in the last you know, years of his life, uh, finishing up his work on 9-11. Um, but he was very concerned about it, and he was showed a lot of solidarity and, and did engage in activism around the COVID events. And there are two reasons in particular that we wanted to uh, do this symposium in honor of Graham. One is that Graham, uh, as many people will know, uh, did some very important research into the anthrax attacks um, and wrote a book called The 2001 uh, Anthrax Deception. Uh, and these are the anthrax attacks that followed on the heels of, of the 9-11 events. And uh, Graham, I think, persuasively made the case in his book that uh, the anthrax attacks were essentially part two of the operation uh, that began with 9-11. And um, I think we can also look at uh, the anthrax attacks as an as a important step or, or instrumental moment in the evolution of the biowarfare and, and biosecurity state. Um, and uh, really, for me, at least, I'm, I'm not aware, it's, it's the first um, event I'm aware of where actors within the U.S. Uh, national security apparatus actually used a pathogen um, on uh, the, the U.S. population and even members of Congress uh, in order to instill fear in the general population and to further a specific political uh, goal. Um, and so uh, 
Dr. Merrill Nass, who's going to be speaking at the end of this, the last speaker of the symposium is going to, I think, tell us a little bit more, tell that story of how the anthrax attacks fit into the evolution of the biosecurity state that we are that we are looking at today. Um, the other reason I think is that if Graham were still with us, I think he would be arguing um, for the sort of unification, or at least for having tremendous solidarity between the 9/11 Truth Movement and the uh, what, what I guess I would call the COVID resistance movement. Um, he, I think it's it, it's clear to many that at, at a minimum we are talking about very similar methods being used in terms of this being a structural deep event and how it was carried out. Um, and we're possibly also dealing with uh, o- at least overlapping actors behind these events. Now, I'm not, I'm not an expert in that. Some of the people that are gonna be speaking uh, after me are gonna, are gonna explore that question more deeply. Um, but I think that fortunately, we, we have started to see a lot of progress in this regard. Um, in terms of the 9-11 Truth Movement, probably a majority of the 9-11 Truth Movement um, does embrace a skeptical uh, position on the COVID events. Um, I think that there is still a segment that um, is perhaps reluctant to, and um, speaking from my own experience, I would say that probably has more than anything to do with um, the difficulty of wrapping one's head around what are what are the forces and what are the what is the agenda that we're dealing with here. If you come from a sort of traditional left perspective, and you've been concerned about the events of 9/11 for a long time, it might be because you, you know you see imperialists or militarists as Perhaps you know, as as really the 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 actors behind 9/11, um, and you might have less, you might have more trouble um, understanding or wrapping your head around what are we talking about with COVID-19? What's the agenda here? Who's behind it? And so I think some of the speakers are going to be able to shed some light there and help make some connections. Um, on the COVID side, I think that uh, I think that there is a, a tremendous openness uh, to um, studying 9/11 critically. I think that we've seen a, a resurgence in interest in 9/11 in the last year or two because of the COVID resistance movement. Um, but I would still say that there's, um, pr- you know, prominent members of the COVID resistance, whether it be researchers, uh, thinkers, or you know, media figures, um, who haven't, who, who, who don't embrace a critical perspective of 9/11. Um, and and I would posit that that their perspective, their analysis of COVID, might be deepened and strengthened by also looking critically at the events of COVID. And I would also posit that 9-11 might offer a uniquely uh, revolutionary potential um, that COVID as an issue on its own, um, on its own at least, does not, does not quite possess. Um, and so I would like to see the, the coming together of these two movements even more. Um, and I think all four of the speakers that, we, that, that are going to speak today um, uh, can be very powerful uh, voices uh, in, in that regard. All four of them have fearlessly uh, looked at the events of 9/11, the anthrax, the anthrax attacks, and the events of COVID, um, and, and straddled those issues um, eloquently um, and, and in a rigorous way. Um, and so I, I look, I look forward to these talks tremendously. And just to very quickly run through the speakers, and then I will. Um, I'm also going to we're, we're going to play a short video clip from Peace War 9/11 for people who do not know uh, Graham McQueen or didn't didn't have a chance to see that film. Uh, and then Marilyn's going to share some thoughts. But just to very briefly run through the speakers. Um, we're going to be hearing first from uh, Dr. Niels Herrett. Uh, Dr. Herrett is perhaps best known for his uh, research into nanothermitic material found in the dust from the World Trade Center. Um, and he is going to be speaking on 9-11 COVID as two sides of the same coin. We're then going to hear from Dr. Piers Robinson, uh, who is the research director of the International Center for 9-11 Justice. Uh, and he's going to speak about understanding the agendas of contemporary global power elites. Next, we're, after that, we're going to hear from Dr. Madhava Sethi. Uh, D- Madhava is an anesthesiologist and a former senior science editor at Children's Health Defense. Uh, and he's going to speak about common challenges facing the 9-11 and health freedom movements. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Dr. Merrill Nass. Uh, Merrill is a medical doctor and a biological warfare researcher. Uh, and she is going to speak about the WHO pandemic preparedness agenda and efforts currently underway, which she's helping to lead uh, to prevent the passage of the WHO Pandemic Preparedness Treaty. Um, So with that, I would like to uh, play the clip from Peace War 9-11 and then uh, ask Marilyn to share her remarks. And we're all supposed to believe this was Al-Qaeda who sent these. Al-Qaeda has somehow taken a, a great dislike to senators in the Democratic Party who are trying to hold up the Patriot Act. It's ridiculous, okay? 
These were very sophisticated anthrax letters, highly weaponized stuff. When an aide opened the letter for Dashiell in, in the office, it floated out like cigarette smoke and quickly contaminated the entire Hart Senate building, which then had to be closed for several months for cleaning. It's not easy to get anthrax to behave that way. And we've had several studies of it which show that it's the most sophisticated anthrax spores ever seen. And the only people that we know for sure that can make it are in the United States. Dugway Proving Ground or Battelle Memorial Institute, those are the two main suspects. And Iraq, which they tried to implicate, was nowhere near that in their sophistication. Even if they still had their anthrax program going, which they didn't, they had destroyed it. But even if they had, they couldn't make that stuff. And um, I don't know how, how it is that the planners failed. And uh, some honest scientists jumped over the fence at some point here, um, but they did. And so then the whole thing started to collapse. There was no case against Iraq. So then they were forced into a desperate move, uh, what's called a limited hangout. We will admit some things are true in order to protect the big truths. We will admit now that this, and this is by December 2001, so this is happening quickly. We will admit that this didn't come from Iraq, even though we said it did. Didn't come from Al-Qaeda, even though the letters looked like it did. Came from somehow within our own military industrial complex. But it was a guy. It was one guy, a sick guy. It was the lone nut. And they charged, ultimately, Bruce Ivins. First it was Stephen Hatfield, then it was Bruce Ivins who conveniently took his own life before he could go to trial. And so then they proclaimed the whole thing was over, the case had been solved, case dismissed, tried to put the anthrax attacks to bed. Thank you. and. Very moving always to see Graham's face and hear his voice. Uh, if you haven't seen the whole film, I encourage you to watch it. I'm really happy to be part of this event commemorating one year since our beloved colleague, Graham McQueen, transitioned to the ancestors. And it's only fitting that we'll offer you the outstanding lineup of speakers that uh, Ted enumerated just now, um, who all evoke the impeccable principles Graham and John. When I first met Graham 13 years ago, I was pleasantly surprised to learn that in addition to his extensive knowledge and research about 9-11 and the anthrax attacks, he was also open to exploring pervasive media deception around other deep events, including the JFK, MLK, and RFK assassinations. When the COVID mass hysteria kicked into gear, with the lockdowns, masks, impending vaccine mandates, etc., I was relieved but no longer surprised to learn that Graham also questioned the official narrative about COVID. And we had several conversations about that during the last couple years of his life. Um, in a presentation he gave here in Oakland, California in 2016, Graham identified the TUR method used by the power elites to control people's perception and behavior. Um, the, the T stands for threat, the U stands for unity, and the R stands for response. He gave some examples of how this was applied to U.S. Congress members on 9-11 and to Canadian parliamentarians in 2014 when there was a false flag attack there by the uh, Here's how it works. First, they threaten people with an unexpectedly shocking and lethal attack. And then promptly, um, pr this prompts political enemies and adversaries overcome with emotion to become unified, even hugging each other, and then go along with, it, with whatever ready response is laid out in my voice of we both agreed that this exact same phenomenon occurred with the rollout of the COVID event, minus the hugging, of course. Now, um, as a peace activist all his life, Graham recognized the importance of not only seeing through the hypes with a critical eye, 
but also engaging in grassroots mobilization and mass action to counter the nefarious agendas. In January 2022, even though he was in a weakened state from his advanced cancer, he bundled up and went outside in the freezing sub-zero weather to stand with others on a freeway over crossing in Hamilton, Ontario, and cheered on the Canadian truckers who were driving through his area during their protest against the unjust vaccine mandates. Were he alive today, Graham would surely be out there protesting the machinations of the corrupt and captured World Health Organization to ensnare us all in a totalitarian biosecurity state. So as you'll see, today's program will connect lots of dots and offer important pathways for taking action. Uh, Ted, back to you. Thanks, Marilyn. That was that was wonderful. Um, let's bring on Niels now. 